Well, President Trump has suspended Thanks, his threats of imposing that 5% tariff on Mexican imports, accepting Mexico's promise to dial up immigration efforts. The latest skirmish is prompting debate over the use of tariffs as a negotiating tactic, with the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal weighing in. They wrote, businesses depend on consistent policy to make decisions on how to deploy capital, and willy-nilly tariff threats create uncertainty that retards investment and growth. Mexico may be building a wall against migrants on its southern border, but the U.S. economy is paying for it. Joining us from Washington with more is Jessica Smith. So, Jess, what exactly is in the deal? And also, what then does this do for the prospects of USMCA? Well, what's in the deal? Mexico has agreed, as you mentioned, to send troops to its southern border. It will send 6,000 troops to its southern border to try and crack down on migration. Mexico is also going to allow asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while they wait for the process to go forward in the United States. Mexico will offer jobs, health care, and education to asylum seekers, and the U.S. will work to speed up this process. As for what's not in the deal, Mexico did not agree to a treaty that would have given the U.S. the ability to reject asylum seekers if they did not seek refuge in Mexico first. That's the safe third country agreement. That is not there. The New York Times did report that much of what is in this deal, Mexico had already agreed to. The president has taken issue with this, and on Twitter, he he said, you know, there there could be more coming. He hinted that there was more to this agreement in the works. Um, also, we're looking for some clarity on those agricultural purchases that the president has talked about. He says Mexico will begin to ramp up purchases of U.S. agricultural products, but there's no paper on that at this point that we've seen. And the Mexican ambassador was asked about that on one of the Sunday shows over the weekend. She says with no tariffs in place and with US, UMC, USMCA ratification, trade will increase. But she didn't really have anything to say about an agreement that was a part of this deal. As for the USMCA, what you, um, that, that still needs to be approved by all three countries. I think this gives it a better shot. But the president still has to get House Democrats on board here in Congress. Okay, we have that issue, but you also have the attempts by Congress to tie the president's hands in the future when it comes to tariffs. Is there anything that uh, Congress is doing to maybe prevent what we've just been through from happening in the future? You know, we'll see if there's appetite for that once lawmakers get back to Washington today. They have worked before to try to curb his ability to put tariffs in place based on national security. There is a bill that's in the works right now to try to find a compromise on a way to do that. Um, so we'll see if there's any movement on that front, because as you heard in that Wall Street Journal editorial, this idea among business groups is not popular to use tariffs as a negotiating tactics. Republicans on the Hill did not like this. So we'll see if there's any movement on that legislation to kind of claw back the president's power. All right. Thank you very much, Jess. Let's turn to the panel for more on all of this. And joining us now is Carlos Peterson, a Eurasia Group, Mexico senior analyst. And there are some people who are saying that even if this deal is a rehash of what was already promised, the president wins because he used tariffs and the Mexicans came to the negotiating table. What worries you about this tactic? Yes, no, absolutely. I think that that is completely true. Uh, Mexico had agreed to some extent already to, one, keep uh, immigrants looking for asylum in the Mexico side of the border, and the other one is to deploy more troops and, and increase the checkpoints in the southern border. But the problem here is that we are entering an electoral cycle in the U.S., right? And immigration is a huge issue for President Trump. So as we get closer to the 2020 elections, these kind of threats are going to continue and are going to increase. And in my view, I think that Mexico granted, granted to a, a very quickly victory to Donald Trump in this case. They didn't fought back that hard as they could have a little bit with all the help the, both from the business community here in the U.S., from Congress. And now President Trump knows what the weakness of Mexico is, and he can continue to push on them to get other concessions, to bring the issue of immigration again uh, back on the table and continue uh, using it as a political tool. Well, something I've been trying to figure out during this whole situation is what more can Mexico realistically be doing, right? Because as we just said, and as Jess was just talking about, Mexico essentially agreed to a lot of things that it was doing already. It just played them up or packaged them in a different way. So what kind of flexibility does it have, especially since not only is it dealing with our immigration complaints, it's still dealing with a pretty serious drug war uh, yes. in Mexico? No, absolutely. I think, I think that 
Over the short term, there is a little bit that Mexico can do. He can increase, they can increase the, the deportations from the country. They can send some troops to the southern border of Mexico, and that can help uh, a curb down immigration to some extent. However, these are structural issues that are really, really hard to solve. And over the medium to long term, it's going to be very difficult for them to really stop immigration from flowing through the country. Carlos, do you think, uh, th just to, given this, this nature of the situation, U.S. companies will, let's say if you're an auto supplier, uh, would you move production out of Mexico? You don't know where the president could land ultimately next. Yeah, I think that's very complicated. Uh, Mexico signed a, a trade agreement with the U.S. back in 1994, NAFTA, and the value chains that have been built between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada through the past 30 years are so entrenched and the economies are so well connected that really moving production from one country to another, it would be extremely complicated to do. So this threat of tariffs, is just like putting together issues that is immigration with uh, trade, with all these politically charged problems that Donald Trump wants to bring to the table. So I find it difficult for companies to use this. Uh, obviously, if the threat of a 25% tariff would have come in October, that would have been a completely different story. But 5%, I think, is really hard for, for that to really change. But I think Carlos is, is raising a very, very important issue. And we need, we need to keep very clearly the distinction when we're dealing with Mexico and Canada versus when we're dealing with China. Mexico and Canada are are deeply integrated, they're part of the industrial production cycle of the United States. It's completely embedded. It's different than uh, just applying tariffs on a few TV sets and things like that coming from China, right? You're really affect basically altering and, and playing these tactics uh, to the limit can really alter business confidence within the United States. And those tactics that you, Adam, you're referring to, uh, those tactics, are, they are always pulled when the market is at new all-time highs, when this administration feels that the economy is really in a strong place and market sentiment is really strong. That didn't happen in well, Q4 after a 20% correction. Yeah, well, Carlos, let me ask you. So we can expect that there's going to be another round of this at some point before 2020. Yes. What leverage does Mexico have? Uh, you know, this time they came running to Washington. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's limited by, uh, by the leverage that Mexico has by itself, right? Mexico has a lot of allies inside of the U.S., and I think that's the strongest leverage that it has. The business community here, uh, states, Republican states that rely significantly on exports to Mexico or imports from Mexico, and that lobby can really get activated. And that's why I thought that Mexico rushed a little bit the decision of like just complying and, and agreeing with everything that the U.S. Was, was asking for, right? Because they could have waited a little bit longer and test whether it was kind of a bluff or to see whether the implementation of the first was taking place. I think those are the leverage that Mexico has. But beyond that, there is not that much. I think it's going to be more political. Uh, we'll we get closer and closer because Trump will have to increase the credibility of his threats at some point. So the, the risk of these getting implemented, not exactly the 5%, but some other kind of threat, uh, I think increases after this, this, this event last weekend. Well, Carlos, if there's more to come, hopefully we can have you come back again and help interpret it all for us. Yeah, Appreciate your time. Carlos Peterson of the Eurasia Group. He's the Mexico senior analyst there. Thank you.